lights for us in the transmission. I mean, we could do. We just don't have to do a little bit more. Will we please come to order? Okay, we've, over the past few months, we've done our Bob series for beginner observing basics. We talked about just basic basics the first time. We talked about telescopes and, you know, taking care of your equipment and storing your equipment. Then last night we talked about talked about fake fuzzies, what they are, and what to expect when you see them. Okay, this month we're going to talk about star hopping. So we're going to do a, a program on star hopping basics, and I subtitled is uh, playing hopscotch across the stars. So this is sort of dear to my heart because <coughs> have you ever felt when you're out with your telescope, have you ever felt like you were lost in space? Well, when I began this, this, this hobby, I was lost in space about the majority of the time. So, this is the way I started. So I started with that little orange telescope on there, it was a six inch uh, F8 Newtonian. Uh, and this little finder here that is four and a half degree finder, it was a straight through it was backwards and it was very difficult for me to try to star hop. I had the, the Norton Star Atlas and I had that atlas that I got from Sky Telescope. Both these are very difficult to use as far as I'm concerned. They were not very user friendly because they were very small. They have a lot of information packed into a very small space and I can say and we'll get into this. If you choose an atlas, make sure you, you pick a good atlas because those atlases were not good. They were not user friendly to use in the dark. Uh, and to be honest, some of the stuff that I'm going to tell you tonight was in my about telescopes, all about telescopes by Sam Brown that I probably read back then, but I was young and I knew everything and I wanted everything just to be in the telescope. I didn't want to have to, to search for it. I didn't have time to figure out any of the stuff that I needed to do to know where I was in the sky and how to get there. I was trying to sweep with the telescope and find stuff and that just doesn't work. But if you learn how to star hop, it's not that difficult because I can tell you from my experience about 50 years ago, to the point that that orange telescope went in a closet and it stayed there for a matter of years. And in fact, there, when my daughter was middle school and above and I was working too many hours at work, I dropped out of the club and tell, I didn't do anything in astronomy for a number of years. And then as I started seeing retirement age come closer and closer, I told my wife, you know, I think I'm gonna go back and get back into astronomy. So I rejoined the club, I bought a new telescope I was no better at star hopping then than I was 20 years before that. So I ended up going to a push tube and then a few years ago, I was doing an article in, in our newsletter. Well, I did a program similar to this about five years ago, I guess it was. And then from that, I decided, okay, I'm gonna write a series of articles in the newsletter about the Messier object and as I was writing the article, I was going to find the Messier objects myself, work on my Messier pen, and since I hadn't done it in almost 50 years, I was determined I was going to get my Messier pen and my certificate. To do that, you have to star hop. You cannot use the go-to, you cannot use any digital setting circuits, you can't use your cell phone, you can't use any aid other than star hopping to your object and keeping a log. I had been up to almost 70 objects before. I never kept a log, so it still wasn't any good. So I was determined to do that. So I went back to some of my references and Alan McRoberts is one of the senior editors at Sky and Telescope. Years ago, he did a series of articles in Sky and Telescope on star hopping. And then after that, they wrote, they put it into a book that had all his, his star hops in it and in the first part of it, he goes over telescopes, he goes 
and it has one chapter on star hopping, specifically on star hopping. And then later in the uh, Sky Watch magazine that they, Sky and Telescope normally does once a year, they did for a number of years, he took that article and he duplicated it in that magazine over a few years. So I went back and I said, I read over it, and it just, he just sort of lays out just real simple. Okay, this is the way you do it. This is what you need to do, and this is how you do it. Once you have the tools to do it with, this is the way you do it. <coughs> so I looked at it and said, okay, I can do this. So that's where my star hopping articles came from and how I started learning to star hop. So this is what my program is based on. So what is star hopping? I couldn't find a good definition of it, so I wrote one myself. A method of finding objects in the night sky utilizing stars and star patterns we can see to guide us to much fainter objects that we cannot see. So we're, we're starting on stars that we can see, and that's why in our, that original program that we did in Bob, that's why I emphasize that you, you, know, you need to learn these bright stars and learn what constellation they're associated with so when you get to the point that you want to find the object and it tells you where, what constellation they're in, then you can look for these signposts, the bright stars, to locate the, the constellations and start from there to find other stars in the constellation. Okay, star hopping. What is star hopping and why do we star hop? Okay, some of you are old enough to remember paper maps. Used to, before you had cell phones and maps on cell phones and maps in your cars, you went to a Rand McNally star, or, tele, or sorry, Atlas. road map, Atlas. So if you wanted to go from, if you've never been to Atlanta and you wanted to go to Atlanta, you would get your Atlas app, you'd open it up, say, okay, here I am in Chattanooga, and I want to go to Atlanta, so how do I get there? Well, you hop to Dalton, you hop to, Ch to uh, Calhoun, you hop down to uh, Cogsville. Yeah. <laughs> Adairsville, <laughs> and then Marietta, and then Atlanta. And if you want to get more detail, then you go to the section of Atlanta and the streets. So it's basically the same thing as star hopping. If we want to find the Orion Nebula, we start usually the easiest way is to start with the three stars in the belt because they're very obvious. And from there, we hop down to the source, and there's the Orion Nebula. So that's where star hopping comes from. What do you need to star hop? Okay, you need a good atlas. You need a good star atlas. You need a telescope of some kind, or binoculars, or something to use because you're not going to see those objects with your naked eye. You need something to that you <laughs> you can see them with. We need a finder scope because now we'll find out why we need that finder scope. There's some field of view tools that we'll go over here in just a minute that just help you and we'll show you why. You need to know which way is up. So there's a difference here. <laughs> when you start using the telescope, you'll realize, like the kids, everything's backwards, or everything's upside down, or it's upside down and backwards. So now you need to know, okay, which way is up, which way is north, which way is west. You need to under you need a good understanding of star hopping on the basis of, okay, this is how you do it. This is what you're trying to do. It's not that difficult. And then. This is something I can't help you with, and something I never had at the beginning, is patience and perseverance, because I gave up. Okay, you need, first thing is you need to invest in a good star atlas, and I mean a good star atlas. This is the Norton star atlas, the one on there. That's the Norton, that's the other one, I can't pronounce the name. And then this is the pocket atlas that is available right now from Sky and Telescope. They have the pocket and they have the jumbo. If you look, these are pointed basically to the same areas of the sky. If you look in here, you'll see the Andromeda Galaxy, and there, I think right there, is the Andromeda Galaxy. And then this, see how the star atlases have improved over the years. Don't go out and use one of these old atlases. Get you a good atlas. Look at especially look at what, how faint do the stars go 
if you find one that goes to like seventh magnitude and it's on 10 pages, don't buy it because it's going to be at such a compact scale. It's going to be like the Norton over there. I'm sorry. It's going to be like the Norton Star Atlas. It's not going to have any information. It's going to be so cluttered, you're not going to be able to find your way around. So look for a good basic star atlas to start with. This is my go-to, which I just showed you. Those are very reasonably priced. Some people hate them. Some people love them. I love mine. I have like three of the jumbos that I have in different places. I have one in the box that I take out with a telescope. I have one upstairs and one downstairs that I'm always reaching for. I sit and just won't be watching television with my wife, flipping through, looking at things in the Star Atlas. This atlas is, is if, you, if you buy one and you go through the board and you read how, why they did it, you'll understand the basics. And it's, it's very well thought out and very well done. If you want to get more advanced, now the Interstellar, and that's just a few years old. I think it's only like maybe two to three years old. And these guys had a different idea about the way to present the information on the atlas. It's very well done. Uh, and then the Euro Metro, which has been around for a number of years, it's a lot more detailed. So I'm showing you the atlases I have. Now there are other atlases. There's Cambridge Atlas. This one is not that. This one is, is the same atlas. It just has all the Herschel objects. That's, that's a good atlas. And this is a very old version of the, the Sky Atlas 2000, which is done by Sky Publications. And it's, this one is, I think, about $1,920. But the it's out of print, isn't it? Right now, you can't get it. It's going back in print, too. But this one yes. is out. But <laughs> so this this one is, has been well used. But these are very large pages. The map is very well done. This one's been well used. It's been put up wet, too. Yeah. Uh, that's a good atlas. So if you want to get more detailed, then these would be the ones to look at. Okay, so what is the difference? So if you go to a higher magnitude, which means you're looking at dimmer stars, higher magnitude means more stars, means more charts, because if you try to put more stars on a small chart, you're not going to see anything. You're not going to be able to, to tell anything about it. More charts, more deep sky objects, more complexity, and more dollars usually because the price will go up. So you can look at the pocket atlases, 80 charts, 30 just well, almost 31,000 stars of 1,500 deep sky objects. You may think that's not very many if you look at these others, but 1,500 deep sky objects will keep you busy for a few years because just get through the 100 Messier objects and then start on the Herschel 400. Herschel 400 will keep you busy. Uh, but you look at the next one down, which is the Interstellarium. It's uh, 114 charts. It's over 200,000 stars, over 13,000 deep sky objects. And the price range there depends on which one you get. And I'm going to qualify that last one, which we have one right here. The only reason it's so expensive is all the pages are laminated pages, so it's plastic. So this is the field of vision, which means that you can take it out and, and get wet if you don't have to worry about it. You can get around that. I've had my pocket atlas out many times in the dam. All I do is make sure when I get home, I open it up and let it dry because it will get soggy and crinkly. Uh, and then the Euro Metro is 220 charts and a bunch of stars and a bunch of deep sky objects. If you've never used one and you're familiar with terrestrial maps, there's a little bit of difference. Terrestrial maps, you have north at the top, south at the bottom, west on the left, east on the right. A celestial map is opposite on the east and west. 
And do you know why there's a difference now? Anybody? Richard does. <laughs> okay. One, you're looking down, so they do terrestrial maps because you're looking from the sky down. They do sky atlases like you're looking, you're holding it up and looking. So if you line with north, then west, east, north, south. So it's just offset. And that may not make any difference to you. When you get your atlas, learn about it. Learn how it's laid out. Learn the laser tells you how they, they signify the different types of objects. Uh, learn the magnitude scale and how they do the stars and learn how to tell what, you know, how bright the stars are and try to associate with those, those with the stars in the sky. Okay, a telescope. Now, start off and you can use just about any telescope. It doesn't matter. You can use a pair of binoculars. If you use a pair of binoculars, the difficulty is if you're trying to hold them up and you get to a point and you're like, okay, now where do I go from here? And then you have to look again. You don't have, you've lost your, where the, the, they're pointed. It's better if you're going to use binoculars if you have them on some kind of mount so you can, you can look back at your, your atlas and go back to the binocular. A telescope usually in that problem if you have a telescope like a Dobbs that doesn't have a drive on it, you may have to, if you spend more time looking at that, let's come back to it, you may have to move the telescope back to where it was. So you can use just about any telescope you want to. You just have to do all this stuff and associate, okay, where am I? What do I need to do with this telescope to locate the objects in the sky? Finder scopes. I'll start with unit power finder scopes. Unit power means that they don't magnify anything. So you have the red dot finders that a lot of the telescopes come with now. Uh, they just project a red dot on like a heads up so you can look through the screen and you can see the stars and you can say, okay, that red dot is right there on that star. Those are okay, but as you advance into dimmer objects are closer to some of the dimmer objects they're going to be harder to use because you're looking at an unmagnified field and it's kind of hard to locate some of the deep sky objects using those so i would suggest upgrading and you can use a, a green laser uh, some people like doing that but if you're at a star party with people that are imaging they might get a little irritated at you you have to be very careful about pointing it when airplanes are around because they say you can get in trouble for it. Uh, if you go to some of the larger star parties, they will be outlawed at larger star parties because if you have 500 people there and there's 50 people using a green laser at the same time, they're going to pitch fit. So they, a lot of the star parties, I think Texas is one of them. I tried to find out a teach state, but I can't find any information on it. But they'll tell you in the rules that you can't use the green laser. Uh, LRAD and the Rigel Quick Finder, they're basically their reflex. They have a little target switch. Looks like this. So you'll see the circles there, same thing. It's a heads up. You can look through that screen. And the TELRAD has a half degree, a two degree, and a four degree circle. And like the pocket atlas actually has a little target. They show how big the target would be on their uh, on the atlas. If you buy a tail rad, which years they've been around for a number of years, if you buy a tail rad, be sure to buy the hood because they fog up real easy, and some of the heaters don't really work all that well. But you will you will need the hood. Uh, you can download even uh, tail rad finder charts off the internet, so they will show you how to get to. Messier objects and just you can tell from the star field where that target needs to be in the sky to locate things and a lot of, you can find a lot of things that way. Finder scope. If you have a red dot or one of the smaller finder scopes, I would suggest going up to at least a, a 50 millimeter uh, finder scope. I have like three or four of these that I have for different telescopes. 
And the reason I have them for different telescopes is because the rotation that it needs to be and aligning that finder scope to the telescope, instead of having to adjust it every time, I just bought one for each of the telescopes and I keep it with that telescope. Uh, also, correct image. To me, it is much easier to look in that finder scope and know when I want to go west, what I'm seeing in the field of view in the finder scope is going west with me and not opposite and upside down. It just helps to get from one place to another place right side up. Okay, when you get there and you look in the telescope, there's nothing you can do about that. The telescope is going to be either backwards or upside down and backwards, depending on what kind of telescope you have. So we'll cover that in a minute, but you can get uh, those are a number of people have basically that same scope. I don't even know how much they are anymore. Uh, that one. That's the one thing. $169. $169. Uh, and so this is an 850. That's a 1050. It just has a little more power. That one has a. Do you have the. Mm -hmm. it comes the, with it. So the reticle is, has a light, it, so it's lit. The other one, this one doesn't. And you can change that eyepiece. It just gets a quarter twenty. Take it out. Okay. Put something else in. And that the other one, you can't. Right. And they also say you can you can if you can rotate the lens, it's a lot easier if you can get the crosshairs left, you know, north, south, east, west. Uh, which the one over there you can't. Okay. So why do we need a, why do we need a finder to start with? Well, if you use a low power eyepiece, which we say a Rule of thumb, a 50 power eyepiece is about uh, one degree field of view. So if you look at one degree field of view, you're just a little bit, well, about two times the diameter of the moon. So if you're trying to use that eyepiece and find things in the sky that you're not at that location yet, and you want to try to star hop with a one degree field, it's next to impossible to do. So, <clears throat> Rule of thumb is a, a normal finder is about a five degree field of view. Mine is a five and a half degree field of view, which is the yellow, and the tail rad is a four on the outer circle. You see that gives you a lot more room to move. You can see more of the sky. It helps you locate, work your way across the sky. Once you're in the area that you know the object is, then you go to the one degree field because you're narrowed it down to the point that you're almost there, now I need to get to the object. And there's a lot of deep sky objects that you'll see in your finder uh, before you even have to even look through your telescope. Once you have your finder, you need to know what the field of view is because that's how you're going to correlate what's in the atlas versus what you're seeing in the sky. So one of the ways to find out what the field of view is, they tell you to find something like the Big Dipper, and you're trying to find two stars that just fit in the field of view. I find that very difficult. I've never had any luck doing that, never. But all the manuals tell you to do it that way. That's one way to do it. They also tell you the best way to do it is to do the drift method. So you want to find a star that is on or close to uh, the celestial equator. It turns out that the belt stars in Orion are very close, I mean almost dead center. It does not have to be those stars. You can align on Procyon or Spica or Altair or any other star. If you have a phone app with uh, Sky Safari or whatever, one of the, you can look, you can find the celestial equator and you can look and find one of the a star close to it. That's what I did the other night. Just find a star that, okay, it tells me that that star right there ought to be very close to the equator. So I pointed the finder on that. You center the finder on the star there. You take your, your phone and you get your stopwatch and you say, okay, it's centered, start the stopwatch. And then you let it drift. You don't let, you don't have the drive on, if it's a dodge, you just let it drift. And you let it drift, and you let it drift. And then about 10, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 minutes later, 
it will go out of the field of view when it comes out of the field of view stop the stopwatch okay so you take that that time in seconds and you divide it by 120 and that gives you the field of view of your finder in degrees in degrees in degrees thank you Jeff. okay once you have that here are your your just a little helpful tool okay so my finder I put it on the scope I aligned with the rinds one scarves and the rinds belt it took 11 minutes so 11 minutes times 60 is 660 seconds 660 seconds divided by 120 I get the 5.5 degree field of view okay so then I went to my atlas and I said and you can use the declination if it doesn't have this which the pocket atlas has has a scale on the side or you can use the declination scale to find okay how big on the atlas how big is 5.5 degrees on the pocket atlas luckily it it is a quarter inch per degree which makes it very easy for us so I took my little scale and I measured so all right five and a half degrees is one and three eighths of an inch so I go around the house with my little scale and I start measuring things that are round and I say okay I've got to find something that's one and three eighths in diameter I found one of my medicine bottles the lid is one and three eighths in diameter so I took a little piece of wire put a little hook on the end of it I wrapped it around that bottle and hooked it looped it around made a little handle out of it put some tape on it and wrote on there 5.5 degrees and I know <coughs> if that goes with this atlas with that finder scope I always have it wow. or hmm? that's what I said I said wow that's a good right okay <laughs> yeah. or you can take a piece of plastic that's the plastic that comes on something that you buy in the store that has that stupid clear plastic on it that you slice your hand open every time you try to get it something out of it <laughs> that's a piece of that and all I did was I took that same lid and I scribed a little circle on it so and the string is on there they one person I saw that it even had it tied into their the sky atlas or you can take a piece of clear plastic that that's just the window glass from Lowe's so I took a piece of it and I scribed and you look that for the pocket atlas that's the scale for interstellar stellarum and that's the other atlas and you can see as the atlases cover more territory or get more detailed they get larger so now you have your little tool and you want to keep that with your atlas so why do I need a stupid wire ring? Okay, what are you going to do with it? Well, we're going to use it because now we know that's the that's what we're going to see in our finder. We know how much area in the sky that's going to be. So now we're going to use it to star hop because we're going to say, okay, I'm starting in Chattanooga and I want to go to Atlanta. So from Chattanooga, where do I have to go to get to Dalton? How far do I have to go? And you're going to use that to step across. Uh, your atlas to find where which stars and star patterns that I want to go to to find their Andromeda galaxy another thing you want to know is which way is up so you're using a correct image finder scope but when you get to the telescope the telescope Newtonian it's upside down and backwards so how do I find which direction it is and I'll warn you if you have a Dobsonian telescope, it doesn't matter where you put that in the sky. Every time you move it, west is different than it was the last time you looked. If you have an equatorial mount, it stays the same because you're, you're pointed toward the north axis or north celestial north. So it stays the same. <coughs> so what you do, you center it up on a star, you let it drift for a, a minute or two, and you watch which way it's drifting and the way that star is drifting is drifting to the west okay so now you know where west is and the reason i'm saying you need number one you need to know okay 
you need to get used to when you look through the eye piece after you've gotten to the location near the location you need to be when you change from your finder to the telescope you need to understand which way when you move that telescope which way is are the things moving the stars moving in your eyepiece so you need to sort of memorize which way it moves once you get used to it you won't even think about it anymore you just know that okay i'm looking at a telescope so if i want to go west i go the opposite direction and most of the time you go the wrong direction anyway and then you realize i'm going the wrong direction okay i need to go the other direction okay so now we know west and you can see here north south east west naked eye binoculars and some finders if they're correct image finders everything's the same but if you're in a newtonian or if you're in <coughs> uh, using a refractor without a diagonal everything is upside down and backwards if you're using a schmidt cassie grain like that or you're using a refractor with a diagonal north and south are okay but east and west are reversed so so once you know where west is now we don't want to know where north is okay what i do with the telescope is i'll back up Okay, now I know where west is, and I'll, I'll back away from the eyepiece, I'll look up, okay, Polaris is right there. So Polaris is right there, I'll either put my finger in the telescope or on the back side, pointing toward Polaris, and I'll look in the eyepiece, and then I'll just barely nudge the telescope toward Polaris, and I'll watch how the star field moves, and the new stars coming in the field are coming from the north and you don't have to push it very much so if you have a telescope that has a drive you don't and you've got it all star lines you don't want to push it so hard that you knock it off you want to just barely push it enough that you can see the stars move and you know okay that's north so i know where north is south is opposite west is, or east is opposite of west now you know where your coordinates are and some of the astronomical league uh, pins, like double stars and things, you'll have to note where north, south, right, Richard, you have to note where north is on the double stars yeah, because they went over the orientation of the double stars are. Okay, so now some practice star hops, and these will be very simple little star hops. <coughs> I put this one in mainly because, and on the next slide will show you, I've been an engineering designer for 50 years now. I've always, I started off on the drafting board with straight edges and pencil. So I'm a straight line kind of guy, point A to point B. I have designed steel structures for a number of years and welded steel structures. Straight lines weld a lot easier than curved lines do. So I always try to use straight lines if I can. So if you read any of my star hops, you'll see that I have put straight edge on there from my star that I start from to my object, and I'm hopping along those. So if you want to find M3, you go to Octurus, you go to Cor Cor Coralie, anyway. <laughs> and you know, if you look on the star atlas, that M3 is almost halfway between those two stars. So you look in the sky and you find Arcturus, you find another star, and you say, okay, I want to put my finder right there, halfway in between. I'll pan the scope over, I'll get it where it's looking almost there, look through the finder, and normally M3 will show up in your finder. So that's the way you find it. Okay, straight line kind. But you do not have to use straight lines, and Ken's curve and Sky and Telescope in the May issue, it's like, well, yeah, that is simpler. If you don't do straight lines, there's another way to do it. You can set your finder up on Octurus and you can hop around those stars and they're very simple because each star will be at the edge of the field of view every time you go. So you start at Octurus, uh, the HD 
12-5-0-4-0 is right at the edge of the field of view, so you can hop up to it. You can put it in the opposite side of the field of view. If you're on the next star, you just hop your way around. So the lines don't have to be straight. You can go any way you want to. You just need to know, okay, I need to stop, start here because I know, Officer, this is very bright. And I can look through the finder and I can see those other stars and I can hop from one star to the other star, to the other star, to the other star, and the next thing I know, I'm right there. So let's say, which this is on the Galaxy Challenge, M81 and 82, Bode's uh, Nebula, or Bode's Galaxy. I want to get from somewhere a known bright star up to where those galaxies are. So there's two or three different ways you can do it. Some people will say, okay, a line on, which I didn't put it in there, the bottom star, bottom corner star in the Big Dipper, on here, you can align those, and this distance here is about the same distance between those two stars. So bring your finder there, come up about the same distance, and go just a little bit more, and you're there. Well, there are other ways to do it. So we need a starting point. So let's say we take our, our little tool and we put it on duty, and we say, okay, I want to go from there up to M8182. What star patterns can I see up there that I can see in the finder? So I'm starting here and I want to go there. What, where do I need to go from here to the next? So if you look, there's that little arc of, or small stars that you can see in the finder very easily. You watch that arc and then it, it comes up to 38. So now you have Duby on one side and 38 on the other for the field of view. So now you're located, you have that nice little arc of stars, so you know you're in the right place. The next move would be, oops, sorry. You put, you move on up, so now you look at, you see another star pattern in there. And one thing I need to say now, look for star patterns, look for double stars, look for stars that make triangles, look for stars that make squares, look for stars that are in line that point you into the direction you want to go. Uh, in this case, we have a bright star that we just hopped to, and it's the bottom of that rectangle. And there's the three stars over to the right, the other stars up to the top side. Okay, when you look in your finder, you can see those. And you can tell, okay, when I have the finder, and I have it centered like that, and I have that star pattern in the finder, I'm in the right place. So the next, you go to the top of that rectangle. And if you look at the map, the star map, you see that those stars are aligned going across. They're getting you closer to the galaxy. So you move the, tel the finder up, you get those stars in the center and then across, and you bring the finder across. And then you have 20, what is it, 24 in the upper, yeah, 24 in the upper. And when you look in the finder, you can probably, in the finder scope, you can probably see M30 or 81. Might be able to, probably can. But when you go to the telescope, to the one degree field, you can find those because they're bright. They're really bright for a galaxy. So that's, that's what you're doing. So you're saying, okay, I want to find this object. What star can I start from? What star is bright? that I know I can see very easily. I want to start there, okay, where do I go from here? Where do I go from Chattanooga to the next star, to the next one, to the next one, to get to my final destination? That's all you're trying to do. <clears throat> it's very simple to do. You just have to learn and be patient and do some work before you go out, okay? I'm going out tonight and I know Orion's up, <coughs> and I know I want to find 
the Orion Nebula. That's easy to find. Okay, but I want to find M78. M78 is up and across out from the belt. Okay, how do I start? It's a belt star, and I, I star hop up to it. Uh, M78. Or uh, I want to go to Andromeda. Andromeda is easy to find in a pair of binoculars. I want to find M33. Okay, let me bring up a good point here. <coughs> okay, another thing is you can use your cell phone. You can go to the Sky Safari. And what I've done, I've put loaded into my phone. I've put a 5.5 degree field of view target in Sky Safari so I can call it up so it shows on my screen and I can say, okay, I can look and find dimmer stars that are, are fainter than what the sky atlas shows. And I can use, I can also flip, just like a Newtonian, I can flip the image in my phone over and upside down. So when I look at it, I'm looking at the same field of view that I would be looking at in my eyepiece using a Newtonian. Or I can flip it the other way if I'm using a Celestron I can, or a, a refractor, you can flip it and set it up any way you want to in the phone. So yes, you can use your phone to get a more detailed view. <coughs> so beware. One thing, I'll say this, make sure that you're hopping from the correct star. Yeah. This is why, I'll tell you the story of why I'm telling you this. I was trying to find M34, which is one of the first objects I was trying to find for the Messier hop to. And it was very simple. You you go from Algo over to Almac, and it's about halfway. So it was a very simple thing. Just start at that star, put the binder about halfway between, bump it up just a little bit, and M34 is a nice, big, pretty, bright, open cluster. It's easy to find. No. So I spent one night, spent about 30 minutes one night looking. Never could find it. It's like, okay, I give up. I'm going on. And that's another thing. If you get to the point that you can't find it, just, it's better just to don't totally get frustrated and just get mad. Just go on to something else. Come back to that later. So I, I did it one night. I said, all right, I can't find it. I'm going on. I did other options. I came back the next time. Same thing. I couldn't find it. It's like, what is going on? This I should be able to see this with no problem at all. Third night, I go out. Same thing. I'm spending about 15 minutes. I finally I stop and I look. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's not the right star. I was going from here to there, halfway between us. There's nothing there. So once I figured out that I was going from the wrong star, I went down, found the, the right two stars, and in two minutes I was there. There was no problem. So make sure that when you set it up that, okay, I need to hop from this star to here, make sure that you're on the right star when you start. Getting lost during, <laughs> if you get lost, which you will, <coughs> you'll go and you'll say, okay, what was next? I don't know where to go. So you're lost in space. Okay, back up, go back to your starting point, and go again. The next time you'll remember a little bit better of what the next star hop is, and it may take you sometimes three or four times going through your star hop to find the object. Sometimes you go right to it. But if you do get lost anyway, then just Stop, go back to the beginning, and walk, go back through your star hop, find your way. Magnitude and size. Okay, if you go to an atlas or something that, let's say you want to find M33, it's a big, huge galaxy. You see pictures of it, it's this big, huge, bright galaxy. And if you look, it says that it's, it's magnitude can't remember, it's like five or something like that. So you think, magnitude five, 
man, I should be able to see that with my eyes. You know, it should be easy to find. And you go, you saw hot food, there's nothing there. Wait a minute. If you go back and you look again, it should be really bright. I should be able to find it. M101 is another one. And I had problems with M108. I had problems with 78. Look at the size and look at the magnitude. And remember that when they say this galaxy is this magnitude, but it's this big, it's bigger than the full moon. In fact, it's two or three times the size of the full moon. When they take that much, uh, an object that size, and they say it's a five fifth magnitude thing. Think of a fifth magnitude star that is expanded to this size. So what they're saying is the fifth magnitude because they're taking all this light in that big of an object and they're compressing it down and they're saying that it should be the fifth magnitude if you could compress it down. It's a very weird way to do it, but that's mm -hmm. what they're doing. So watch the size of the object compared to the magnitude. If you're looking at M81, it's very bright, but it's very small, and it's very compressed, and the magnitude is high, but it's very small. So it's very concentrated. So don't get frustrated trying to find 101 because it is very, I cannot, from my home in Red Bank, I cannot see M101. I have never seen M101. I can get it in the camera, and I can see it, but I can't see it in the telescope. Even my 16-inch, I can't see it. Yeah. Saw that too. I could see yeah. that. No. Uh, sky conditions make a big difference <laughs> because if it's hazy outside and you're trying to find big sky objects, no. So, and if you're in town versus outside, light pollution makes a big difference. Yeah. Uh, impatience makes a big difference too. <laughs> So what have we learned? Okay, so now that I know how to star hop, I can find anything in the sky. Mm, yes and no. There are people out there that they will never use a go-to telescope. They always want to star hop. And the challenge for them is finding that object, no matter how long it takes, how hard they have to look, they're gonna find that object, so they're gonna put. There are other people, and they will go to some things that I would never even try to find with hot two. Theoretically, yes, you can find anything in the sky by star hopping, given that you can see it with your telescope. But it may be some things that you're, you won't be able to see it, or the sky conditions that day, or when you tried, won't do it. The light pollution was so bad, you can't do it. So. Yeah, you can star hop, but there's a lot of, of other things that, that say, yes, I can see it or no, I can't. Uh, prepare before you go outside. Decide, okay, I'm doing the, the Herschel 400, so each night before I go out, I make a list. I want to find this object, this object, this object. And what I'm doing is I'm going by constellation. So I'm saying, okay, and I'm doing the EAA also, which you can do there instead of star hopping. And there's a story behind, behind why I'm doing it that way. Uh, the more you practice, the more you learn how to, what, the better you get at it, the more you practice. Patience, patience, patience. Yeah, you have to be patient and you have to give yourself a little slack. If you can't find something one night, skip on down your list go to another object, come back to it again. I've had to do that a number of times in the, the Herschel stuff. Uh, above all, enjoy your time out. The reason that I'm doing EAA on the Herschel 400 is a bunch of those objects are open clusters. And if you get into Cassiopeia or uh, what, another good example, a bunch of stars are a bunch of uh, open clusters that are near the Milky Way or in the Milky Way. Some of those clusters, it's like, you've got to be kidding me. This is a cluster? Because there'll be like five stars and 
yeah, there's a clutch, there's a cluster there, and I've hopped to what I think it is, but there's a cluster here, there's one there, there's one there, there's one over here. Which one is the one that I'm looking for? Because all that gives you is a number. So then I'm getting my phone app going saying, okay, I'm looking for NBC so-and-so. I need to see an image. And then you look at the image, and the image is, is from a camera that is zoomed in on it. I can't see enough stars around there to tell where I am. It's very difficult on some of these objects, and there are tons, tons of open clusters that are stuffed in there together. And I finally just had to give up and say, okay, I'm going to let it go to because it's legal to do it. I'm going to let the go-to take me to that object and tell me this is the object I'm looking at. That's the only way I could do it. So, star hopping sometimes won't work, <laughs> but in a lot of cases it does. Anybody have any questions? What's a DAA? DAA, Electronic Assistive Astronomy. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. That's what we're doing at the star parties. There's some of us are doing at the star parties now. So, the end, and there's some of my galaxy pictures from the uh, uh, galaxy challenge. What, what are those in the bottom right hand corner? <coughs> this is the boat. One? No, 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 no this, this is the whale, and that's oh, okay. the hockey. That's the hockey puck. Wow, I didn't know you could actually see them in the same view. Yeah, okay. that's a seventy millimeter, four hundred thirty. Focal inch, millimeter focal inch. Is that the one in the center of the problem? Is that M51? That's 101. Uh, one, that's 101? That's yeah. what it looks like. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and then 45, 65, uh, 63, I think, and 83. I believe it's one. Wow. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing you know, your pre prep, do you actually. Uh, Draw out the different steps and the different symbols you're looking at, a square, a triangle, whatever you're looking for. What I'm doing, Tom, is, is in some cases I do, in some cases I'm noting. I want to start here, I want to hop to, and I'm noting what stars that I see on the atlas. I'm just making a little quick note. Okay, start here, go to this star, go to this star. And then usually when I'm at the telescope, I have the atlas near me. And I look at, okay, what hop, I start here, and I'm looking at the atlas at the same time, finding those other little stars and going from, from there. So I'm not drawing everything out. One thing they tell you to do is, okay, if you have the telescope you can flip, you can turn the, the atlas over, flip it around backwards. They even suggested you can do a mirror and look at it as a mirror image, and I'm like, I tried that. It's like, okay, I, no, I couldn't do that. So I'm, I guess I'm gifted in because of what I do for a living. I've always, it's always been easy for me to look at something and in my mind, flip it or turn it over. Or I'm looking at it saying, okay, my finder scope, I know if I go this way, I feel the telescope, I look at where I need to go in on the chart, and then I look at the eyepiece, and I'm, I'm gonna start here, I wanna go to this star, so I look at the eyepiece and the telescope, and I move the telescope a little bit. If I'm going toward that star in the eyepiece, I'm okay. If I'm going opposite, I need to turn and go the opposite direction. So it's just, before you make a big move, look at the eyepiece and say, okay, I know I want to go, I have this star centered, I want to go to this star, and as soon as you start moving, it should be tell, I'm going there, I know I'm not going there, stop, make sure you're going the right direction, and once you know you're going the right direction, now go, go to that star, and look at your atlas and find out, okay, where do I go from here? And just hop. So, big moves you can go in the, in the finder once you get closer to the object, and then you've got to go to the telescope, and do your fine little skinny to get to your object. Look at the star field, like 101, when we were at 
uh, traveling cameos and I, I tried to find one on one and swear in. I couldn't find it. So I went on. Well, later I was over talking to Matt. Matt said, hey, look at one on one in my cold set. I looked at one on one, it's like the same. That was the same star field I was looking at. I couldn't see it because I didn't take time. It was cold and windy, really windy that night. And everything was bouncing around. I didn't take time to really look. But when I saw the star field in his coat, it's like, I remember the star field. I was right there. I just didn't see it. So I gave up and I did that on EAA <laughs> from the house, which I could do for red bike. The eyepiece makes a big difference, too. Eyepiece Changing makes a up difference. the magnification can help. <coughs> yeah, and that's, and that's counterintuitive that's, because yeah. you were the one that told me that um, a higher magnet or a higher. Or a, um, yeah, higher magnification, magnification sometimes on bright. galaxies, especially when you get in globular clusters, sometimes it's better to bump the, you don't think about it, you think, they say, all right, start with a, with a low power eyepiece, get more field, get more light in. But sometimes when you get into those dim objects, it's better to go up in power and it, you will, sometimes they'll pop out. And the AL wants you to use different eyepieces and note in your log, I look at you know, this eyepiece and it looks like this. I look at this eyepiece and it looks like this. They like to see that. Yeah, we got uh, Greg from uh, where, where be, where by? I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, what version of Sky Safari do you have to have for the build of view feature? I think any of them. The and last I, three versions. I have the Pro. Five, six, and seven. <coughs> I do have the Pro. Okay. But I don't have any of the others. But what the, the yeah, Pro I, I, uh, Stellarium has it. What does? Plus does. Plus, the yeah. Okay, so Plus has it also. Yeah. It's the standard pre version guys. Really? Yeah, you, so you can just can't control the telescope and such with the pre version. That's it's yeah. it's just but yeah. I think all the tools are there. Yeah, yeah. most of us don't. Or the Stellarium, I know you can do it in Stellarium. Uh, so apparently any of the sky safaris you can do it in. And it's in it's under a third, I think. Uh, we might need to do a class on sky safari. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be interesting. Good meeting on the program. Yeah, it's or just some work there. Not it. Sometime where everybody can sit around and do it. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Are we, are we ready to find out who's a vampire when we turn on the yeah. light? Yeah. <laughs>